The Bible contains the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, and the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are holy, its precepts are binding, its stories are true, and its decisions are immutable. Read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, and practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you, food to support you, and comfort to cheer you. It is the traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian's charter. Here, paradise is restored, heaven opened, and the gates of hell disclosed. Christ is its grand subject, our good, the design, and the glory of God, its end. It should fill the memory, rule the heart, and guide the feet. Read it slowly, frequently, and prayerfully. It is a mine of wealth, health to the soul, and a river of pleasure. It involves the highest responsibility, will reward the greatest labor, and will condemn all who trifle with its sacred contents. Pray it in, read it through, live it out, and pass it on. Isn't it amazing that children have all these amazing toys these days, but yet they still want to play uh, with things they're not allowed to play with, like the television remote. I mean, they want that remote more than any toy you could give them. Hayes got a hold of the remote a couple of times on Wednesday, and since he's been walking for about four months, if he gets something that he shouldn't have, I'll just say, thank you, Hayes. Let me have that thank you, and he'll come over and just hand it to me. Well, Wednesday, got the remote first time, and he was across the room, and I was like, thank you, Hayes, bring that to me. And I got my first. <laughs> Why do we say yes to the things we should not have or should not do, and no to the things we should have or should do? I think that's a constant battle for everyone. It was even a battle for the Apostle Paul. Well, we finished up our series today from Milk to Meat. And we've looked at reading God's Word, studying God's Word, meditating on and memorizing God's Word. And we finish up to this morning by noticing we must apply the Word of God to our lives. In other words, we need to do what God's Word says. If you have your Bibles, you may want to turn to James chapter 1. I'm going to begin reading with verse 22. But notice what James has to say about applying, uh, doing what the Word of God shares. He writes, Do not merely listen to the Word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the Word, but does not do what it says, is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror, and after looking at himself, goes away, and immediately forget what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Which leads us to notice first this morning, yes, no, no, yes. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means we often do say yes, to what we should say no to, and no to what we should say yes to. And when it comes to God's Word, we cannot have this formula in our life. Andrew, Andre Satona was a Hungarian soldier during World War II that was caught and imprisoned by the, Rome, the Russians. They put him in a prison a thousand miles from Moscow. Then everybody seemed to forget about it. So his family and friends thought he had died in the war. Well, the United Nations, 56 years later, discovered that he was still in that prison and he was still alive. So they began the process to get him freed and they were successful. So after 56 years, uh, 56 years after he walked into that prison, he walked back out of that prison. 
And the first thing he asked for was a mirror. There were no mirrors in the prison. He didn't know what he looked like any longer, so he asked for a mirror. And the witnesses noticed that his first look in the mirror, uh, they all agreed, was shocking to him. He did not recognize the face looking back at him in the mirror. Well, we are called in God's word to become a resemblance of his love. To look more and more like love every day. In other words, to look more and more like Jesus every day and less and less like ourselves. When we apply God's words and ways and truth and commands to our lives, we begin to look more and more like Jesus. More and more like love. When Jesus was baptized, we find this response from God. Matthew 3, uh, verse 17. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, with whom I am well pleased. I, I do not believe God only reserved that statement for Jesus. I, I believe when we apply and follow His ways and commands, He looks at us and says, You are my dearly loved daughter, in whom I am well pleased. You are my dearly loved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. He looks at us and feels that way about us when we reflect the love of his firstborn, Jesus Christ. You know, you ever thought about, isn't it amazing that Jesus is our father, our brother, our best friend, and our savior? Only God can pull that off. Therefore, two years from now, 20 years from now, or even 56 years from now, we should look different. We should look more and more like Jesus, more and more like love. There's a theory called the looking glass theory, and it states that you become what the most important person in your life thinks you are. Now, depending on the caliber of people you surround yourself with, that could be really good or that could be extremely bad. The calling on our lives as Christians, from God as his children, is that Jesus becomes the most important person in our life. When we know what he thinks of us, how much he loves us, that he's pleased with us, that we're dearly loved, that he wants to bring joy into our life, we become more and more like he pictures us to be. We want to know his word and remember his word and remember our reflection after looking in the mirror because we want to make sure that we look like Christ and know his word and it's in our hearts. And that will lead us to have the life Jesus came to give us. We will live a life to the full. And it all begins with obedience. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commands. Not make up commands, not follow the commands of the world. Obey his commands. Obedience says, I trust God to decide for me. In all my decisions, I trust God to decide for me. Now you might say, well, how's he going to do that? Well, you've got to get his word. His word will help you make every decision you can make on this earth. He will give you the answer. It was word through his Holy Spirit through prayer. Columbia University did a study and found that the average person made 70 decisions a day. That means over the course of an average lifespan, a person will make 788,500 decisions in their life. Well, keeping in mind that our decisions shape us into the person we are, those are often important decisions we make. So I want to challenge you to simplify your life. How, how do you do that? Well, by truly deciding to obey God and allow Him to make your decisions for you. Trust Him to make the decisions in your relationships. Trust Him to make the decisions in your finances. Trust Him to make the decisions concerning what you look at, what goes in your mind, what goes into your heart, and what comes out of your heart. Now let me ask you a question this morning. How many of you struggled to make a decision this week? Had a hard time with the decision? Raise your hand. Don't be shy. Raise your hand. All right? Now how many of you not raising your hand are struggling to decide whether or not to raise your hand. All right? How many? Okay? Probably a couple. All right? 
Well, we need to allow God to make our decisions because we have this devil out there roaring like a lion wanting to steal our life, our abundant life through Christ. The abundant lives we can live through him. So let me ask you this morning, ask yourself this, this morning, which way do you live your life? Do you live your life saying, I obey, therefore I am loved? Or do you live your life saying, I'm loved, therefore I obey? If you live by the first statement, I want you to know you'll never have a one life. You'll never have the joy of Jesus Christ. You will always be disappointed. You will always have periods of misery. However, if you live by the second statement, you will have joy even in this hope even in despair. You see, we can't measure up to God. We just have to know we can be worthy, holy through Christ because He first loved us. You see, we obey God when we realize it's a joy to do so because He dearly loves us. Now, how many of you have ever received a gift card? Right? That's some crowd participation thing. Most everybody, right? Yeah. Most of us have gotten several over the past 20 or 30 years. Well, I heard this week that two to four billion dollars worth of gift cards end up never being used every year. Two to four billion. So if you fall into this range this morning, I'm going to give you my advice. All right? All right? There it is. I will take them off your hands and put them to good use. We'll cut into that two to four billion dollars. Well, here's the point. God has all this wisdom all these promises, all these gifts he, he wants to give us. However, so much of what he gives way too often, way too often, goes unused. Goes unused. Notice James 1, verse 25. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. James is saying, read God's word, respond to God's word, apply God's word, and reap the rewards of God. We need to do more than just read. We need to apply it to our lives. We need to do what it says and let, us change, let it change us into Jesus. In Matthew, Jesus tells a parable about three servants who were given gifts. The first two put them to work, the last one buried the town. The master, when he returned, was pleased with the first two because they had gone to work. They had changed their talents into more talents. There had been a change. The one who buried the talent, he was furious with it because there was no change. You know, we often talk about the one who buried his talent when we look at the story. This morning, I want us to notice what he said to those who did the right thing. Matthew 25, verse 23. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Now, have you ever noticed that last line? That last part? The most important part. The part that should have us diving into the Word of God. Applying it to our lives. Come and share your master's happiness. That should be the focus of our lives. To share in the happiness of of our Lord and Savior, our Master, Jesus Christ. So how do we apply the words of the Bible in the correct way so that we are making sure that we are doing what it says in our lives? Well, I want to finish up this morning by using the example of baptism when it comes to applying God's Word and doing what it says. So the application is baptism. You have to apply the Word of God all over the Bible, the Word of God, to understand the importance and, and the meaning of baptism. Now, many have not done this, so there's great confusion on what a person needs to do to be saved today, and that's why we have so many different churches with so many salvation stories, so many ways to Christ. Some have created a, a salvation of faith only. They apply verses like Acts 16.31, they reply, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your house. So they'll take that one verse and say, all you have to do is believe. And they have developed this faith-only, belief-only type of, of faith. They will say that their church believes, all you have to do 
be saved is believing, even though there are many verses, examples, and passages, again, throughout the Old and New Testament, concerning the fact that you must be baptized. Some have created a salvation of faith only by applying verses like Romans 10, 9. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. They then went on to create things like what is known as the sinner's prayer. And so at the end of the service, they'll have to say that prayer, and they'll tell you because of that, Jesus has accepted you and you're saved. But you will not find this prayer in the Bible. Not in And again, they will refuse to apply the words of baptism or the necessity of it. Some will say it's good to be baptized as a demonstration of your faith or as an act of obedience of faith. Again, the Bible doesn't share anything like that concerning baptism. Some will say you need to be baptized by the Holy Spirit, not the water. They will give the example of the Holy Spirit coming like fire into the disciples. However, this was a temporary gift of the Spirit. It enabled them to speak in tongues and heal and do miracles. It was not the Holy Spirit gift that Peter preaches about in Acts 2.38. Now you might say, well, why why baptism? Well, this is why you have to look all over God's word to apply uh, his word and, and do what it says when it comes to things like baptism. Immersion and, and why. Uh, why is it vital? Some will say it's not. It's not a deal breaker. It's not essential. It's just water and an act. Well, for those who feel that way, again, you need to apply God's word to your belief. Not man's. So how important is water to God? How important is water to us? Well, let's begin with the beginning. Genesis chapter 1. When it comes to creation, it says this concerning water. First of all, it says, in the beginning, God was hovering over what? The waters. He was hovering over the water. Then he created the lights, the sun and the moon, and then it says he separated the waters and made dry land. He, he then uh, went to work on animals and organisms and uh, trees and nature. Do you realize that a tree is 50% water? That a cow is said to drink 100 gallons of water a day? Just look up sometimes, sometime how much water it takes to make a piece of cheese. Uh, it's amazing. It is said that up to 90% of some organisms' body weight is actually made of water. So the water continues. And then next, God creates man. Man is said to be 60% water. So we apply God's creation story, and so far, water is pretty important to God, vital in the creation of this world and life. Then we notice the, the stories from the Bible from God's word, and we apply them. The great flood, what did God use to bring righteousness back to the earth? Water. Flood. We find the story of the Israelites who went down into the water, then up out of the water, and God collapsed the walls of water to destroy the Egyptian army and set his people free. There's a story of Sodom and Gomorrah where God rained down burning sulfur to destroy those wicked cities. Now you may say, well, what does that have to do with water? Well, Lot's wife is said to have drifted back, stayed behind, couldn't let go of what was inside of the war, and it says she was turned into a pillar of salt. So what did that, what did that burning sulfur do? It dried up the water, took the life of those people, of, that, of, that, of those cities. Well, next we find Jonah, three days, three nights in a whale. And what was the whale in? Water. What the whale do? Set him up on land. Then he went to Nineveh and shared the salvation of God. Then we get to the New Testament and keep applying. We find John the Baptist preparing the way for Jesus. And what's he doing? He's baptizing people. He's immersing people. He's using water, baptizing them for repentance of their sin. Then he baptized Jesus. You don't want to. He said, "No, you should baptize me." But Jesus said, "No, you have to baptize me to fulfill the word of God." Next, we find Jesus talking to a sinner and telling her that the water he will provide will allow her to thirst no more. Live forever. So we apply all those stories and situations, and then we notice the conversion story Jesus has with the Pharisee. John 3, beginning with verse 3. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. 
He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who has come from God, for no one can perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they're old? Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to the flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. Now water here is described in our birth on earth and in our, in our birth in, into heaven. Into the Spirit. We must apply that part of God's word to our life. We need, then need to obey the instruction on how to be saved that Peter gave after the very first sermon after Christ had died and resurrected. At the very end of that sermon, the gospel, he tells them that Jesus died, was buried, raised to life to save them while they were yet sinners. And the people listening said, what do we have to do? What do we have to do? We don't hear, you must say this prayer, ask God into your heart, ask Jesus into your heart. No. Peter says, Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That Spirit Jesus talked about with Nicodemus. Repent and be baptized every one of you. Move on from there further into the book of Acts and you will find that every conversion story includes baptism. Why? Every single one. Now don't go back and join me, because that's what people are tempted to do when you talk about baptism. They'll say, well, well we've got the thief on the cross. Well, you need to understand the thief on the cross died under the old covenant. Jesus hadn't died. Jesus hadn't been buried. Jesus hadn't resurrected. Even if he could have come down off that cross, he could not have been buried into Christ. Every salvation story from the point of Jesus' resurrection includes immersion in water. Now, you might say, well, why is water baptism essential to God? Why is it so important? Is the water special? No. The water's not special. Is the person baptizing you special? No. You know, several years back, I used to say, when I baptize someone, I am now baptizing you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Well, now I don't say that. And if someone's baptizing someone and they want my help, I tell them the same thing. I say, be sure and say, you are now. Because it's not about the person being doing that, baptizing. It's about Christ being buried and resurrected. It's about the person being buried and resurrected. You know, the blood of Jesus shed for us 50% water. Could it be that water baptism is vital to God because he's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow? Ever thought about that? Yesterday, creation. Today, our life revolves around what? So eternity? Why? Does it kind of make sense when you think of that, that, that Jesus, that God, is the same yesterday, today, tomorrow? And that means water was essential in creation. It's essential in life. It's essential for eternal life. So after applying what the Bible has to say about water and baptism, I believe this is the logical response. I believe this is what the Word of God leads you to. I mean, think about it. Even hell is about water. What's going to be in hell? Lakes of fire. Never quit burning. Stagnant lakes of fire that will dry up the life of the people living in hell. Well, what's going to be in heaven? Rivers of life. Rivers of life. You see, to truly obey God, you not just read the Word of God. You have to study it. You have to meditate on it, memorize it. And you have to apply it so that through Christ, you may know Him and do what He says, know His truth, and live forever. We're going to finish up this morning with a video. It's a perfect ending to this series, and it's also the introduction to our new sermon series that we are starting next week. The sermon series is titled, I Am.
maker of the heavens I am The bright and morning star I am The breath of all creation Who always was and is to come I am The one who walked on water The one who calmed the seas I am The miracles and wonder So come and see Oh, follow me And you will know That I am The fount of living water The risen son of man The healer of the broken Spirit deep. 